1 to 18, that's the first reading. I think you'll be in on screen. Um, you can see Nathan's been left by himself now, managing multitasking. Right, so this is the first one. And I read um, in Corinth. So after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome, Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned, uh, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came to Macedonia, from Macedonia, uh, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when he, when they opposed Paul, uh, sorry, but when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he took out his clothes in protest and said to them, "Your blood be on your own hands. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles." Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, Justus, um, a worshipper of God. Um, Crispus, <laughs> the, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who had heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack or harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word, the word of God. While Gallio was a proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people of worship to worship God in ways contrary, contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about San Mis Misdemeanor, thank you, <laughs> or a serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But sis, since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of, of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. Paul stayed in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at St. Cre <laughs> because of a vow he had taken. Amen. Some interesting names there. Um, now, the next one is uh, First Corinthians, and this is what the, uh, said, the start of the series, what, is ba what, we're basing the, what, what Robin's based to preach on today. And it's First Corinthians, so it's basically the beginning of the whole book, of the whole letter, and it's verses 1 to 9. And it says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brothers and I'm a brother of Thenis, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because his grace uh, given in you Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, do not lack any, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He would also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Lovely. Let's take a moment again just to say hi to one another and then we're going to dive into this and, and look at what it's saying to us this week. So greet one another, find out how everybody is and then we'll get on with it. Okay. Right. Should we come back together? Um, as, as Lewis has said already, start of a new series today. New series, new haircut. Um, I think I've shared before my hairdressers, uh, I go to a Turkish barber, it's actually a Kurdish barber who, who cuts my hair, um, and they do the thing where they try and set fire to your ears. <laughs> they burn the, ear, the hair in your ears by putting like this kind of like, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's like a bud, it's like an earbud, and they dip it in this flammable liquid, squeeze it out, set fire to it, and then do this thing where they kind of waft it in your ear and then kind of cover your ear with the hand. And sometimes it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> it's like really, it, I guess if you've mastered the art 100%, you'll just kind of waft this thing and you won't feel anything. Just burn. So I'm, I'm always slightly reluctant to go to the hairdresser. Why, why I persist with this p uh, one, I don't know. But I did say to Genghis, my hairdresser, I said, if you watch YouTube and go on our church YouTube, you'll see me with my new haircut doing the talk this week. So, Genghis, if you're watching, <laughs> thank you. And uh, anyway, the, the, this series, we're calling it a resurrection people. And, you know, Paul writes this letter to one of the early churches, Church in Corinth, and we'll look a little bit more of, about that in a moment. But he writes this letter... And what he's seeking to remind them is they are, their lives have been completely transformed by Jesus. Their status, their, who they are, who they are as individuals, who they are together, completely radically changed once and for all and on an ongoing basis by Jesus, the risen Lord. And what he reminds them again and again, which is what we do with people who are getting baptized, your old life has, has died. Thank God. The old life that was messed up, that was hurting and was hurting others, that life has died. Now you have come alive in Christ Jesus. Live as a resurrection people. And you know, that message for the early church in Corinth, in present day Greece, you know, that is a message that's relevant to us today. We want sometimes to go back to the old ways. Sometimes we find it hard to lay down some of these things which are so precious to us. And sometimes we find it hard to pick up the new things, the things of opportunity and life that God invites us into as, as resurrection people. And so this is a series that's going to just remind us, hey, we're resurrection people. Let's enter into everything that God's got for us, both as individuals and as a people. I'm just going to read out what, what I jotted down in connection with the series. The gospel requires God's holy people to live in purity and unity. We are invited to be a resurrection people. We've died to sin in the old ways and now we're alive in Christ as a new creation. Church is both the gathering of the risen 
but also the space where we learn to live differently as new people and as a new community. 1 Corinthians is a letter written by Paul to a church that he knew well in a major commercial city in Greece that had so much potential, but that was also marked by failures, by immaturity and by immorality. This was a church that Paul had helped to found and in which many Gentiles had come to faith, so people who weren't from a Jewish background. One or two of them were wealthier Romans, but the majority were either slaves or freed men and women, so the lower strata of society. God's grace and God's love extends to the Corinthian church and encourages Paul that God is able to work in them and through them. The invitation then as now is for the church to rise up, to be different, to leave behind the past and the old life and to step into the new life as God's resurrection people. We can learn much from Paul's message to the Corinthians and we can't but notice the ongoing relevance and applicability of these words to life for Jesus' church in London in the 21st century. So that's what we've got ahead of us with this series. We're not going to rush. It's quite a long letter and it's, a, it's quite densely packed. So we're going to take our time. We're going to go through it at different points. Uh, we'll stop and we'll, we'll do other things along the way. But what I'd like to do with the time that we've got together today is just provide a little bit of an introduction to the place, to Corinth, and to the letter. And then we'll look at these nine verses that we read at the beginning in a little bit more depth. And my encouragement is if you've got a Bible app on your phone, do turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 9, because we're going to come back to that as we go through together. So let's think, uh, firstly, a little bit of an introduction. We, we won't take too long with this, but I did want to uh, just uh, provide a little bit of an introduction to uh, Corinth, Sorry, this isn't, doesn't seem to be working. Um, and we've got, I've, I've found a really cool YouTube video of what Corinth would have looked like at the time of Paul. So um, I don't know if we could, if we could put, put the video on. Um, it just, when I watched this, it just helped me to imagine what it would have been like actually being there in the city. I like to immerse myself in these things. I like to immerse myself in the history of it. Has anyone actually been? Has anyone been to Corinth, where the site where it was? No. You have, yeah. You can still see some remains, can't you, and some, uh, some classical remains. Okay, here we go.
glorious history in the time of the Greeks. And um, then when the Romans came, actually uh, Corinth uh, allied themselves with some people who were opposing the Romans. And so what happened about 150 BC, that kind of time, they got completely destroyed. The Romans completely destroyed the city. And then in the time of Julius Caesar, so roughly 50 BC, uh, Julius Caesar rebuilds the city and he takes freed men and women. So in other words, people who'd been slaves but had earned their freedom. He takes them from Rome and puts them in this place in Corinth. So these are these are the, the they're not slaves, but they're, they're in the low, low strata of society. And they get taken out of Rome and put there. And then because of the location, really, of Corinth, which is a strategic location, I've actually got a map I can show you, because we, ne- we need maps, don't we, from time to time. Here you can see it. Corinth. So over here. Um, because of its location... It actually, uh, having been refounded by Julius Caesar, starts becoming prosperous again. And what happens when a place starts making money? Well, it attracts people then from all over. They start coming in. This is where the money is. And they start, um, the place starts getting built up again. So in terms of what you, had f- what you would have found, what Paul would have found when he went into Corinth, was at least 28 different temples to different gods. Some of them to classical got Greek gods. Some of them, uh, the Romans adopted some of these Greek gods a- and worshipped them as well. You would have also had worship of Caesar, who was also claimed to be a god. You also had from, from further east these mystery cults, which came in and, and people were worshipping the, in these ways. But you also had enough people in Corinth to, who were Jews to have a synagogue. And what happens if we think about uh, Acts 18? Acts 18 describes Paul first going to, to Corinth. And what does he do? He goes to the synagogue. He meets with uh, the, some of the uh, people there. And he begins to try and persuade the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah that everything that was prophesied in the Old Testament has been uh, about Jesus, that he's, his death, his resurrection, a- and his return when he comes back are confirming that he's the saviour of the world. And as he does this in the synagogue, some people, some of the Jews start to believe him and say, yeah, I, I agree with you, I think you're right. And, and, and they, they start asking further questions of Paul. Uh, But this stirs up animosity among the Jews in the synagogue and they chuck Paul out of the... Paul actually says, okay, I'm leaving, I've had enough. Uh, But one of them, the the leader of the synagogue at the time, Crispus, uh, uh, actually goes with Paul. He's the leader of the synagogue at the time. He goes with Paul and, and joins him. And what does Paul do? He goes next door. He goes right next door to the synagogue did you notice that? Titius Justice's house. And they starts meeting there. And so now you've got a few Jews who are believing in Jesus, but you've also got the doors open wide to, to Gentiles, people who hadn't got a, a Jewish faith, coming and learning about Jesus and hearing the good news uh, about the Savior of the world. And then we have this account of this kind of riot this, this uh, opposition uh, to Paul from the Jews who bring their petition in front of the, the, the council. And uh, then, then uh, Sosthenes, who presumably has replaced uh, Titius Justus, uh, sorry, replaced Crispus as the leader of the synagogue because he, he went with Paul. They appoint a new person who's Sosthenes. Sosthenes uh, gets beaten up. Did you notice that? They all start turning on him, start beating him up. I think there's a few reasons why that might have happened. It might have been the Greeks, actually, who resented the Jews trying to stir things up and turned on him. Maybe it was the Jews who turned on Sosthenes. But either way, um, 
we find at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, Sosthenes mentioned again. Did you notice that? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul writes to the church in Corinth together with Sosthenes. And I don't know if this is the case, but I quite like it. Imagine Sosthenes as the new leader of the synagogue, the leader of the synagogue that opposes Paul, going before the council to appeal that uh, they shouldn't allow Paul to keep doing what he's doing and to punish and discipline him. And then the crowd turns, not on Paul, but on Sosthenes, beats him up. He's now at home with his family, recovering from a beating. I think it's entirely in character for Paul that he would have gone and visited Sosthenes, his enemy, the one who was trying to get him chucked out, the one who was trying to get him persecuted, and actually extended love and forgiveness and, uh, and care to Sosthenes in that moment where he's been beaten up. And I wonder if that kind of thing happened and that persuaded Sosthenes actually to put his trust in Jesus. But when Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he writes it together with Sosthenes. And we're told in Acts 18 that Paul is actually in Corinth for 18 months teaching and preaching the gospel. 18 months he's there with this group of people. So he'd have got to know them quite well. He then leaves uh, Corinth and goes on to Ephesus. And probably around three years later, he writes this letter to the church in Corinth. He's already written... Uh, another letter before this. He will go on to write other letters to the church in Corinth. There's also this toing and froing of associates of Paul, people like Timothy, people like Titus, who go to Corinth and take messages. And we uh, read in 1 Corinthians uh, about how Chloe, who's a member of the church, her and her household are, are going to Paul, who's no longer in Corinth at this time, and they're asking for his advice, for his ruling as the apostle uh, concerning certain things. So what's the message that Paul wants to communicate right at the beginning of this letter? He wants to communicate that Jesus is enough. The church in Corinthians has got a big task to spread the gospel in that place and to send people to other places in, in the area. They face big challenges. They're just a minority group. They're opposed. And they also have big problems. They have big problems within their group. They're a small group. They're immature. They're inexperienced. They're disunited. And in that context, the question can easily be raised, is Jesus enough for this church and for the Christians in that place? Is his grace big enough? And for us today, we can sometimes find ourselves asking that question about ourselves, about the church in our country at this time, about ourselves as Christians. Is Jesus enough? We sing songs saying, your grace is enough, more than I need. You know, we sing these songs, but in the moment of challenge, that question gets raised again. Is Jesus enough? I've put my trust in Jesus. Is he enough? And it made me think of uh, going abseiling. How many people here have been abseiling? I've never been abseiling. I... I can be quite happy to live my life without going abseiling. Uh, uh, you know, it won't you know, just uh, ruin me. Uh, but they do say, and you can comment on this, those of you who've been, that first moment where you go over the edge and you put your trust in the cables and the clips and all the other things, that's the moment that is the most nerve-wracking uh, where you're like, is this going to hold? And you're looking down, you're seeing the, you know, how far down it's going. But then after that, it starts getting a bit more fun. Is that, was that people's experience? Those little clips, th those kind of uh, clasps, the, uh, what are they called? Car carab yeah, carabiners, carabiners. Some, some of them are tested to hold real, real heavy weights. 
Uh, and that's important to know because they're basically holding you uh, from a big drop. And sometimes, sometimes uh, that's what it feels like for us when we ask ourselves that question, is Jesus enough? We say it all the time, but actually when we're in that moment looking down, putting our trust completely in Jesus, that question gets raised, is Jesus enough? At other times, it's more like this. We're in that moment, we're trying to trust in Jesus, and we feel like we should put a smile on our face as though everyone's expecting us to be a certain type of way, and inside is turmoil. Well, this um, talk today is really helpfully tackling things to do with a uh, sense that we feel sometimes, all of us feel, of inadequacy in situations and in our place in the world. And this is something that Paul speaks into right at the beginning of his letter. I put a question uh, up on the screen, and it's not a rhetorical question. I, I am going to invite you to, to, to make suggestions on this. But what is it that can sometimes make us feel that our status, our identity, who we are, is lacking? Any thoughts on that? Any things that in life can sometimes say that we're lacking something in who we are? Other people's views. Not easy, is it, when other people are questioning we we'll all have had that experience where we feel confident or we're feeling fine about ourselves until someone else questions it. Are you feeling a bit stressed about doing the talk this morning, Robin? Well, I wasn't feeling stressed <laughs> until you, s you asked me that question. <laughs> I was feeling all right. <laughs> Should I feel stressed? <laughs> Anything else? I think there's loads of things. Voices in our head, yeah. Our imagination, most times, is not our friend. Is it? Our imagination, I wish I was really good friends with my imagination. But many times my imagination is goes to the worst case scenario. It's either telling me something that's going to happen that isn't happening at the moment, something that happened in the past, and I'm like, why can't I just live in the here and now with peace? I mean, I, I jotted down a few things. I think advertising, advertising is premised, really, a critique of advertising is saying that who you are is lacking, and if you buy this product, yeah, you become adequate, you become what is needed. That's consumerism. Consumerism is saying, if I buy this product, I'll be happy and my life will be sorted. Social media. Social media doesn't always help us in these situations. It puts us in an environment where s oftentimes we're looking at others and thinking and comparing ourselves with others. You've also got the cult of celebrity that particularly for young people is just saying, look, these people are amazing. Their life is amazing. You don't have that. Try and aspire to that. How might the church in Corinth have felt that their status was lacking? Well, I said at the beginning, they had been founded as a dislocated people from the lowest strata of society, taken out of Rome, the capital of the empire, put into Corinth. You've got the majority of people who are part of the church would have come from those strata of society, some of them not educated, some of them slaves, some of them women in a society where other religious uh, organizations only let men in. 
So you've got all these things going on that are basically saying your status should be lacking. And it's so sad, isn't it, when, when we observe people who, as they've been growing up, have not received that affirmation that says, you're amazing. And as a result of that, look down on themselves and strive to assert themselves in the world. Or we can think about people whose environment growing up was always uncertain and it, and it lacked. And they respond to that by striving to establish a future with security and abundance. Or people who've been moved around a lot growing up and therefore felt like they lacked a sense of place in the world. These are things that Jesus knows about and it is able to speak into. How is our status changed in Jesus? Well, I think there's some really helpful things in the first couple of verses. They're in the same location. Their location hasn't changed. They haven't just moved. They haven't been transplanted out of that place. But actually, their identity, their status has changed completely. Why? Because verse 2, they belong to God. Did you notice that verse that I said, verse 1 on there? It's actually verse 2. Paul writes to the church of God in Corinth. Did you notice that? It's just a small thing. But Paul is saying, you're the church that belongs to God in Corinth. New River Baptist Church, you are the church of God in this place, one of many. You, we belong to God. If we belong to God, people in the world think that belonging to God is a bad, bad idea because he's going to ask us to do things, or tell us there's things we shouldn't do. But there's a positive, isn't there? We, we believe there's a positive to belonging to God. Our problems become his problems. And as we'll see in a moment, he a is able to equip us. Secondly, verse 2, we're sanctified. Do you know what that word means? It means set apart, made holy. Up until very recently, in Paul's time, they would have said that was just the Jews. They're set apart, a people set apart for God. But now Paul is coming and saying, no, because of Jesus, we're all sanctified. He's the lamb that was slain to make a way. When he died on the cross, the, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. We have access to God, made holy. That's both status. We are sanctified. You're, you're sanctified by Jesus. It's your status. But it's also a calling. Walk in it. Partner with God. Let him work in your life, make you holy. And they are called saints together. Verse 2. It's not so popular to call each other saints these days, is it? It's when we think of saints, we think of like sculptures in old buildings um, of really amazing people. And we look at them and think, that can't be me. If only everyone here at New River knew what was really going on in my life, they wouldn't think I'm a saint. But actually, again, it's status. That's the calling that God gives us. We're saints together. Okay, another question, last question. What can make us feel inadequate concerning our abilities? We've thought about our status, who we are, our identity. What about what we do? What makes you feel inadequate concerning what you do? Because I'm sure there will be things that make you just question your abilities. Yeah, that is a classic, isn't it? We don't do something because we look at someone else who's really, really good at it. And we think, I could never do it as well as that person. That can make us question our abilities. Anything else? Cultural differences. 
really pleased someone mentioned that because I think we find this at play. And it's sad, isn't it, that sometimes these things get questioned in a diverse society. And sometimes it's prejudiced. But God's not like that. And that his church shouldn't be like that. But that can question our abilities in a tragic way. Anything else? So sometimes being in church questions your ability. Yeah, the reality is these things don't just stop when we walk through the door here at the bridge. We, we love you, Joyce. We love you and we affirm you. You're, you're amazing. But I appreciate the honesty there because that is, that is what's going on as well, isn't it? Ourselves, we question our ability and maybe our history, our experiences, the times where we failed, where we said things that we later regretted, where, you know, those social situations where we didn't say the right thing and then we think, oh, I'm not good with people. Those kind of things, the mind kicks in, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, what would spoken over us? I was speaking with someone recently who was sharing with me from the heart, honestly, and saying, do you know, Robin, I find it really difficult to take any form of criticism because internally I'm struggling with a sense of ever being good enough. And this person's a Christian. They'd been trying to explore what lay behind that. And they were coming back to, s it's, c it's complex, but there were things in their past where they'd never received, or very rarely received words as saying, what you did was amazing from their parents. One parent in particular just never, never got that sense. It was always something that they could improve. And that just leads people into to, to that sense of feeling inadequate. And then when... They were in the workplace or somewhere else and they got constructive, critical feedback. It just touched on a raw nerve. It just brought all that up. And you know, it's wonderful the opportunity we have as Christians just to not to ignore these things, not to fight, not to run away, but actually to bring these to Jesus. The older you the older I've got, the more I'm just like, why do I respond in that way, Lord? What is it that's going on? I don't want to be like that. Well, I'm sure these things were playing out in the church in Corinth. I'm sure they could think of other people who are better than them. I'm sure they could think of people in higher up in society who might be better equipped to do things. But Paul really wanted to speak into that. And he's able to say some really amazing things to the church in Corinth about how God, I their abilities now are not just dependent on themselves, but they're now in Christ Jesus. And he says to them, firstly, verses 3 and 4, he brings this message of grace. In, in Roman times, you would start a letter by saying in Greek, karain, which is basically hail or greetings. You would then say who the writer was, and then you'd address the people you're writing to. Paul changes that. He says, I've got a better word. Charis. Charis sounds like Karain, but it's actually grace. Instead of saying just greetings, I want to say, first thing I say to you, grace. And he then follows it up with that word peace. Shalom was the traditional greeting, wasn't it, of Jewish people when they met each other. Shalom, peace. You still find people in the, in the Near East saying that's uh, salam or shalom, peace. And he gives thanks. There's grace. You may have learned growing up in church, grace as an acronym, God's riches at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches 
at Christ's expense. There's also a covenant background in the Old Testament to grace, which is drawn from the Hebrew word, chesed. And it talks about God's faithfulness to the covenant. He made a promise to Israel. And even when Israel was unfaithful, he still remained faithful. That's grace. When we mess up this week, and we're like, I heard that talk from Robin, and I've gone out and I've messed it up again. There's grace. Because God is still faithful, even if we aren't. Verse 5, if you look at it, they're enriched. Did you notice that word? Enriched. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all kinds of knowledge. Christ's poverty, Christ giving up everything, has furnished us with his riches. And this also speaks, and the letter of 1 Corinthians will also speak about the role of the Holy Spirit in this. Our speaking now has the opportunity for the, for the Spirit of Jesus to speak through us. When the Spirit speaks, there's grace, there's love, there's mercy. There's sometimes insight from God that is beyond just our own knowledge. Special knowledge. People in the world know stuff. We all know stuff if we... But there's knowledge about God that is special. That's called theology. Theology is the highest art form. Because it's knowledge about God. But there's also special knowledge, knowledge that comes by the Holy Spirit. He goes on and he says some more things. Our riches, what we receive from Jesus, confirms the good news about Jesus. Let me say that again. The riches we receive from Jesus, which other people begin to see and notice, his grace at work in our lives, is another evidence to people that Jesus is real. Have you had that experience? Or you know someone who's had that experience? Their life, after they became a Christian, changed so much that people kept asking them, what is it about you? That what, what is the change? What started that change? And then it can lead people on to ask questions about Jesus because we start saying, well, Jesus changed me. They're gifted now and in the future. This is a lovely one because it's saying God gifts us now. He can gift us with things that are beyond what we thought we could do. But also Jesus is coming back. And let's not forget, when Jesus comes back, he's going to sort things out. That should give us a sense of freedom and also a reality check. Don't get too frustrated when you mess things up, when you feel like a failure, because Jesus is coming back. He's going to renew us. We're going to be changed people when he returns. Verse 8, we're guaranteed. The word that gets used is, he will keep you firm to the end. Two ideas in that word, confirm. It's a word that gets repeated in the Greek in this passage. I'm probably going to mispronounce it, but it's bebayo, bebayu. And it has the idea, firstly, of something that's firm. Going back to that image of the abseiling, that carabiner, that rope, where you're securing it is completely secure. We're firm, we're secure in Christ Jesus. But it also has the idea of confirming. Jesus confirms us. Jesus says, yep, you're, my, you're one of mine. And then one way of translating that is that God guarantees. He gives us his spirit, which guarantees us that we're his people. It's a down payment. The fullness comes when he returns. 
Then lastly, God is faithful. The temptation, as I said at the beginning, with what the Corinthians are going through is to focus on themselves and on others. If you feel inadequate, you feel like you're going to struggle to manage, it's very hard not to think about yourself in a situation, isn't it? If you're comparing yourself with others and how you compare, your focus is on other people and then back on you. What Paul's doing is he's taking their focus and he's saying, focus on God. Why? Verse 9, because God is faithful. I just thank God that I know him and that I've, in a small way, learnt, learnt that a little bit in my life. Even though I'm not trustworthy, even though I, I do things and I regret it and I mess things up, God, you are faithful. You're true. You don't do that. And I put my trust in, in you. Jesus. Jesus is enough. Okay, we're going to pray. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. And we're going to have the chance in our home groups this week to talk more about these things, to ask questions. But I want to just give us the space. Actually, to bring to Jesus today our feelings that we have of inadequacy where we feel like we're not good enough, where we feel like who we are isn't good enough, what we do isn't good enough. And actually to just be saying, Jesus, I want to I wanna, I wanna really recognize you're enough. You are enough. You're good enough. And you're at work in me. And you say that you love me and you say that I belong to you. And that we refuse to let those other feelings shape our decision making. But we want to make our decision making over who Jesus says we are. Over who Jesus says what we're able to do. And I really encourage you, if you haven't already got one or two people that you really trust to share these things with, to, to try and find people like that. And to actually just share what's going on. Jesus, we just pray today, Lord, thank you that who we are and what we do is now in you, Jesus. And that lifts a heavy burden off of our shoulders and frees us to really enjoy life and to minister your life to others. Do a new work, we pray today in us, inside of us, Lord, in our head, in our heart. Help us to shift our focus from ourselves, from others, in the first instance, to you, Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name.